Okay, so welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be the second one on Martin Buber, who will be the last thinker we'll take up in this class. So uh, in the first video, what we basically did was uh, we followed Buber in making a distinction between an I, it, or objectifying way of being present to each other in the world more generally, as opposed to an I, thou way of addressing each other and being present to the world. So basically, as I was saying a second ago, the I, it way of being present to each other or the world more generally is an objectifying way, which Buber casts in terms of either using, okay, so an exterior manipulative type of relationship or experiencing, in other words, a purely interior type of uh, relationship. But what uh, that does not include is relation, which is part and parcel of an I-thou way of treating each other or treating the world. So an I-thou way means actually meeting each other or the world with everything that we have in the spontaneously unfolding present moment and addressing each other or the world as a kind of sacred thou rather than trying to manipulate the world or each other uh, by way of the dynamics of objectification. Okay, so that was all from last time. Uh, so in this video, what we're going to do is look at uh, part two of the book. So what he does in part two of the book is he expands on that distinction uh, by tracing out how it plays out in a bunch of different areas within our world. Okay, so uh, basically what he's talking about is uh, the Western world, a world predicated upon, uh, you know, the advent of industry and now technology and our age and uh, the, the predominance of rational scientific inquiry as it runs throughout our culture. Okay, so um, he's going to be looking at this I, it way uh, that our world unfolds in terms of knowledge and then art and then teaching. Okay, so uh, what is it when knowledge becomes, uh, well, before we get into that, uh, let's remind ourselves of what we were saying last time about how uh, cultures evolve. Like what we were saying last time is that so-called primitive cultures that are living very close to nature from the point of view of his analysis are much more toward thou saying than we are. We who live in modern industrial technological type cultures are much more um, what would the word be, uh, ruled by the will to it and to conceiving of the world in terms of it in various ways. Okay, so uh, the question then, all right, in terms of knowledge, uh, what exactly is happening when knowledge becomes mostly a kind of it, all right, mostly something to have rather than a way of standing in relation, a way of meeting each other and the world. Okay, so diff two different ways of being present to knowledge. Okay, so the first way, which is probably um, familiar to most of us. Okay, let me look and try to find a quote about this in your notes. Okay, um, la 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 uh, la la. Okay, so knowledge from an I it, sorry about the delay, knowledge from an I it point of view becomes a matter of debating and accumulating correct concepts. Okay, so debating and accumulating correct concepts, like you might accumulate any other kind of object in the world. So knowledge is treated as a kind of it, which possess value only insofar as they serve the master it project of conquering the world. Okay, so knowledge becomes a kind of it when all the, the only value it has is a kind of practical value in terms of uh, instrumentality and ultimately um, the instrumentality, the value of instrumentality is uh, uh, subtended by our project of molding the world according to our own uh, desires and projects. All right, so knowledge just becomes in the service of that. It just becomes a kind of tool, a kind of instrument for, in a sense, conquering the world. Now, the weirdness about conquering the world is that uh, 
you know, from an existential point of view especially, boy, if you, if you really take to heart this idea that what we are is integral to what the world is, and what the world is is integral to what we are, well, then the whole project of conquering the world is ultimately nothing other than a way of conquering ourselves, especially by way of conquering, supposedly, what is integral to our being. <laughs> okay, so if the world is integral to our being, then ultimately, uh, you know, the project of conquering the world is just a way of conquering ourselves, which of course is uh, ultimately probably self-destructive and futile at the very least. So what would the alternative to that be? Well, the alternative to that be, would be uh, to, um, to have knowledge and what we know be an entryway into stepping into relation with the world. So it's not about trying to use the world somehow, or consume the world, or treat the world as a resource, or manipulate the world, or conquer the world, but knowing things as a way of stepping into relation with the world, perhaps even a way of stepping into relation with life itself, perhaps even a way of stepping into relation with each other. Okay, so that's probably not how you would intuitively think about knowledge, especially if you grew up in the West. You know, knowledge is, its main, its main value is that of a, a kind of pragmatism, right? It's not about like stepping into the fullness of life or something about that. I mean, think about, this, think about it this way. Uh, if you're a student and you've spent the last approximately 15 years of your life in an academic environment, well, how how much knowledge have you absorbed is it that has really invited you and drawn you into stepping into a deeper relation with life itself? And how much of it is really about accumulating a type of it, accumulating a type of uh, um, object almost, you know, <laughs> like more and more objects like you have more and more knowledge. You possess more and more knowledge. Ah, well, uh, that's all well and good, but how often do you step into the depth of life along the way? All right, so sort of a, a little bit of a, uh, not just a cultural critique, but I'm focusing a little bit on, uh, you know, the academic uh, project of education, because that's what we're doing here in the midst of the coronavirus and this kind of weird, uh, deferred way of making these videos, but still that's what we're up to, you know? So I hope, I would hope in the spirit of Boober that there have been points in this class where you've come to know things that, ha that have invited you to step into a deeper relation with life, you know? Why not? Why not? As long as we're all dressed up and everything. Okay, so uh, second sphere, art and aesthetics. Okay, so he's already claimed uh, and we went over it in the first video, that uh, I-Thou relation is at the center of all art and all creativity. Okay, so then the, then the question at this point is, well, if that's really true, and if our age is dominated by it, then what, what is art and aesthetics all about? Because, uh, you know, we use the term. So um, here's his description. Uh, this is what art and aesthetics becomes when you're in a world dominated by it. That is how it is made, or this is what it expresses. In other words, sort of, uh, you know, analyzing works of art rather than treating them as aesthetic events. Uh, or its qualities are such and such. And on top of all of that, uh, perhaps also how it might rate. <laughs> how it might rate, you know, like we're, and this is, uh, I'm laughing because uh, there's something really silly about that, but it's very common in our culture. For instance, uh, you know, if you watch shows like, uh, um, like Pawn Stars or something like that, I sometimes watch those on YouTube, uh, and sometimes they'll bring in works of art or at least things, uh, objects that have some kind of aesthetic merit or something like that. And have you noticed if you watch programs like that or maybe Antiques Roadshow, possibly something like that, how quickly the discussion turns to how much it costs? How quickly what might be uh, the savoring of an aesthetic event turns into how much money can we get for it? Well, isn't that kind of strange when you think about it? Well, it's not that strange when you're living in a kind of culture dominated by it, 
right? Because when you're living in a culture dominated by it, the only thing that seemingly has value is something like how well something rates or how many dollars you can get for it. It's like, you know, if you watch auctions of, you know, not just things that appear on Pawn Stars, uh, but sort of big name artworks that go for tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars, like the emphasis is almost always on the auction and the price, and hardly anyone is actually looking at the work of art. Like they'll have whatever, some work by Van Gogh or something like that, or I guess Van Gogh, if you're at an auction, you gotta say it in that sort of Dutch type way. Um, but the emphasis is almost on the bids and running up the price and how much can it get and all of that kind of stuff. And yeah, um, it seems weird, except when you're living in a culture dominated by it, right? So the, the value and the rating system has displaced the aesthetic event. Same thing, I gave you another example in your notes about the Olympics. Like if you watch sports that are not sort of like purely competitive, like how fast can you run, but more or less aesthetic events like ice skating or uh, diving or gymnastics, like sports that uh, where the, the allure is not just an out and out competition, but that really sort of the center of it is watching uh, the wonderful way that people's bodies can move and how, how, uh, how uh, astonishing it can be and how beautiful it can be. Have you ever noticed in the Olympics how quickly the discussion turns away from that and toward which country is winning the most damn medals? You know, as though that were the whole point of it. Well, it is the point of it, once again, when you're living in a world dominated by it. Okay, so the, the taking the aesthetics of the human body, in this case, and bodily movement, and turning it into some kind of contest. Like we do this, there's tons of TV shows on the air that do this. It's like singing shows, like who can sing the best, or there's one I think about dancing, or uh, who's got talent, or something. I don't watch a lot of uh, mainstream TV, uh, but there, I know, <laughs> From the internet that there are a ton of these kinds of shows that are basically about taking aesthetic events and then turning them into some kind of content. I even saw, here's one I saw recently on YouTube. It's like uh, tattoo, tattoo uh, artistry, right? So they'll, <laughs> they'll take once again like a purely aesthetic expressive thing and turn it into some kind of damn contest. So they have these tattoo artists, like I guess, uh, you know, trying to out tattoo each other, or whatever the vocabulary is. I don't even know the words to describe this, but they're trying to out tattoo each other in some sense. And it's like, wow. Uh, and it takes almost a special act of reflection in our world to realize how strange that is. And then another act of, re of reflection to wonder about what we might have lost along the way. And finally, uh, teaching. Like I wanted to, to definitely hit this one because it's relevant to what we're doing now. So the third sphere he talks about is teaching. So uh, here's his uh, way of characterizing it. So teaching in an I-it world becomes simply a matter of imparting knowledge about how things are and or how they should be. Okay, rather than about opening up the thou world and learning to take a stand in relation. Okay, and as I'm saying this, once again, I'm sort of laughing because I bet y'all know what this is about. Like, seriously, y'all know what this is about. So, uh, and if you don't, like, consider, uh, once again, the sort of um, Pawn Stars element of this in the form of grading, okay, and grade point averages, where, you know, what might be a way of opening up the deeper regions of life becomes about a kind of damn contest, Right? And this is not a way of dissing the element of uh, competitiveness. It's a way of, of critiquing when competitiveness becomes the only game in town. You getting it? So the, the critique is not sort of, well, you know, it's bad to compete. That's not true. Sometimes competing can be a wonderful thing. But when competing becomes the be all end all of life, or the be all end all of your college experience or 99.9% .9 of it, you can wonder what we've lost along the way. Like once again, like let me refocus the question on what may be your experience. How many of your college classes have expanded your awareness or deepened your consciousness or opened you to the deeper intimations of life itself or you know, have sort of uh, thrown open uh, the gateways of your perceptual field so that you can perceive beauty more directly and more powerfully. And I bet the answer is maybe now and then, but not that many. 
Okay, so teaching and learning in a world like ours becomes about a kind of rating system or about a kind of competition, uh, GPAs, GREs, uh, you know, in, in the upper echelons where I work in the professoriate, right, it becomes more about sort of what your uh, professorial rank is or how many grants you've gotten or how long your CV is. It sounds almost like a sort of pornography thing, like how long is your CV and if you got a real long one that's like real good, I guess. You know, well, you can have perhaps a short CV and still be uh, very much about opening up uh, a deeper relation to life for all concerned. And that's, that's the uh, the sort of contradiction embedded in the way we tend to see the academic world these days. And uh, the reason why it's important to make note of that um, is because we're all in it, including myself, right? You know, so I think, I think there is a value to be a little bit self-aware of what we're actually doing. Just a weird thought, okay? And, you know, not just being self-aware for its own sake, but maybe uh, being self-aware also for the sake of uh, learning a deeper relation, learning to live our lives a little bit deeply. Whether you're a professor or a student, that's a derivative question. You know, the real question is, how are we living our lives, okay, in relation to what we think we're doing? Okay, all right, so... <laughs> My goodness, it's getting a little personal, isn't it? All right, so next uh, thing he talks about is institutions, feelings, and true community. Okay, so here's, remember when we were talking about uh, using and experiencing? Okay, so using was sort of the exteriorized sort of way of relating to world, the world, and the experiencing was the interiorized way of doing that. Well, similar kind of deal here. So uh, institutions in our world represent the out there part of things and feelings represent the in there part of things or in here part of things. Okay, so of course for him, like life is not really about like the out there or the in here. It's about meeting. It's about contact. It's about relation. Life happens in the between. Are you getting it? Life happens in the between, not on one shore or the other but in the passage uh, between shores, okay? So, um, all right, so here's his critique of institutions and feelings, uh, the way we live them, or at least the way he thinks we live them. Neither one has access to actual life. Institutions, as such, yield no public life. Feelings, no personal life, because all of the depth of life happens in, in meeting. Okay, all of the depth of life happens in the between. And he names a true community as the I-thou alternative to that. So what would true community mean? Um, okay, so, okay, here's the quote. I'll just read the quote. True community does not come into being because people have feelings for each other. Okay, the way we've been talking about it. But rather on two accounts. All of them have to, all the participants, all of them have to stand in a living reciprocal relation to a single living center, in other words, a main theme, okay? And they have to stand in a living reciprocal relation to one another. In other words, true life is about building bridges. True life is about contact. And, and here, I'd like to, uh, you know, maybe for a minute, invite you to wonder about uh, the various uh, forms of uh, separation and division that we're participating in, I think, especially in the 21st century, over the last 10 or 15 years, I would say, uh, specifically in the form of all this identity politics stuff. It's like, wow, you know, if there's ever a way of seeing life that is not about building bridges, it would be that, you know, that that is about sort of me and, and mine and people like me and, and y'all over there, the enemy somehow, you know, and uh, yeah, that's that's not true life. That's that's a deviation, okay? That's a deviation from true life. That's about sort of, uh, you know, perhaps institutions and feelings. It's a way of dividing us. In, in other words, inviting us not to meet, not to have contact, contact, not to say thou to each other. Can you imagine like saying thou in a, in a land and a time ruled by, you know, identity politics kind of stuff? So maybe that would be a point of contact uh, between Buber, who was writing this, what, 97 years ago, and uh, now, so 2020. Okay, so uh, let's see. 
Oh, here's a good one, uh, economics in the state. So two other things he analyzes in terms of this I, it, I, thou distinctions, the economic sphere and the political sphere, which I guess would be topical these days because we're in an election year in the United States at any rate. So uh, the economic sphere. So in a, in a time dominated by it, what is life about with respect to economics? Well, it's about work and possession. So you go to your job and you, uh, you uh, produce hopefully something, and then on the weekend or at the end of the day, you consume. So it's about production and consumption. The economic sphere in a world dominated by it is about production and consumption. And of course, uh, production and consumption is always um, mediated by our desires, right? So it's about getting what we want by way of producing and consuming, that that's the main paradigm for life in a world dominated by it. That's sort of all there is. And I think, I think, you know, you're probably old enough to perceive like how, <laughs> how many people around you uh, just take that without really looking at it too deeply to be the main point of life. Like, you know, you, you, you produce and you consume and you keep doing that and you try to satiate your desires that way and eventually you fall off into the grave and that's what your life is about. So, uh, okay, what would the alternative to that be? Well, once again, the alternative is about saying thou, like, you know, uh, entering into relation with each other and once again, the world more generally, all right? So entering into relation, saying thou with everything that we have. It's not just about getting through the damn work week, trying to be entertained on the weekend, repeat over and over and over till eventually you die. That is a counterfeit, <laughs> that's a counterfeit of real life. Okay, and okay, from a certain point of view, uh, there's a pra practical necessity to it. No one's denying that. You getting it? The argument is not about the pragmatic necessity of producing and consuming. The argument is about what gets excluded when you make that the entirety of our lives. Okay, and Buber's critique is that what gets excluded is the deepest and most precious part of life. All right, so it's, it's a counterfeit in that sense. All right, so same kind of deal with uh, the state and politics. Okay, so uh, once again, um, I'll invite you to reflect on your own experience, which is probably fairly salient these days because, you know, in the United States at any rate, we're in a political cycle. Uh, so how much of all of that, doesn't matter which side of the divide you're on, <laughs> That's another division, by the way. Another way of not building bridges uh, is across the uh, political divide. But at any rate, how much of all of that do you really feel is about thou saying of any type? Okay. And on the other hand, how much of it is about a kind of uh, crude uh, manipulation by way of demographics and uh, highly sophisticated uh, speech writers and spin masters and all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, maybe I've grown a little bit cynical because I'm older than you, odds are. But to me, boy, the huge, overwhelming <laughs> fraction of that whole uh, sphere of life is mostly about it. It's mostly about manipulation. It's mostly about getting people to do what they want us to do and all of that, treating us like objects to be manipulated in a certain kind of way. The ongoing production of images and theater, which has as its primary thrust a form of manipulation. In other words, it. When I look across the political to, uh, terrain, at least at the national level, there's hardly any thou saying at all. And it's not just 2020. So if you're nursing the illusion that, well, yes, this is a peculiar uh, election cycle for sure. I don't hear much thou saying either. It's like, well, welcome to the human race. Can I take your damn coat for you? Because this has been going on a long time. So uh, I'm about to turn 60 and I can tell you that uh, in the last, whatever, 40 years of adulthood, 40 plus years of adulthood, I haven't yet seen a political cycle that has much, if any, genuine thou saying in any way at all. <laughs> so it's not just this election cycle or, you know, uh, you know, the previous, all the previous ones are like that too. And I bet the ones before I, whatever, got on board here on planet earth were like that too, maybe in a different way, maybe less technologically mediated, but probably still the same damn thing. In other words, 
In what sense are you and I being genuinely led by any of this? Because we're looking for leaders. At least that's what we tell ourselves. We're looking for leaders in the midst of all of this. Well, you know, uh, doesn't that sort of, uh, isn't that sort of predicated upon some vision of what actual leadership is about? And, uh, you know, from the point of view of Martin Buber's analysis, there's a world of difference between crude manipulation and leadership in the genuine sense, because leadership in the genuine sense involves at least some appreciable ability to have genuine contact with the people you're supposedly leading. How often does that happen in your life? How often do you feel like you're having like genuine, palpable, uh, holistic, powerful interaction, eye to eye seeing, eye to eye seeing, eye thou speaking with the people that are supposedly your leaders. So it makes you wonder a little bit about what is, is leadership even happening? And I don't think it is. Personally, in the spirit of Buber's analysis, I think that we, we like to think that it's happening, but the fact of the matter is it's all just a way of manipulating objects. And by objects, I mean us. Okay, so, uh, what? There's a snake in here. Okay, hold on. Okay, so, uh, sorry about the interruption. Uh, it turned out that a snake had gotten into the basement and was sort of freaking my wife out, so I had to go and uh, deal with the snake. So, uh, I was in the midst of talking about politics and uh, the counterfeit of leadership, and a snake entered the basement. I suppose you can interpret that as you will. <laughs> Okay, but at any rate, it was a cool thing, actually. Um, I got to say thou to the snake, so that was actually a cool thing. And I took it back into the woods and let him go his merry way as a consequence. Okay, so uh, let's see, where were we? I was kind of on a rant, I guess, before uh, we were so unceremoniously interrupted by uh, the presence of a snake in the basement. Okay, so... Um, Boober. Now, okay, so let's get back to sort of Boober's take on, let's see, what were we looking at? Economics on one hand and politics on the other. Now, his take is that there's nothing inherently uh, evil or inherently I-it about either of these dimensions of life. It's just the way we tend to live them out. Like, there's a I-thou way of participating economically, and there would also be a I-thou way, at least in theory, uh, with regard to politics. So his way of saying it, um, uh, man's will to profit and will to power are natural and legitimate as long as they are tied to the will to human relations and carried by it. See, that's the thing. As long as they're not uh, dominated by it, there's nothing wrong with economics. There's nothing wrong with making a profit. There's nothing wrong with living in a capitalist uh, world. There's nothing wrong with the way uh, power and politics happens as long as it circulates around a kind of thou saying in one way or another, right? Okay, so <laughs> uh, that's, I guess, a way of putting a little cap on that. All right, so I'm going to skip ahead one section in your notes because I think this video is probably getting long enough and I wanted to hit this next thing in this video because it's, I think, makes for a good ending for the video. So he talks about the return. So thus far he's been doing a kind of a, a, kind of a cultural critique, I would say, with respect to the predominance of it and objectification as it runs through many different dimensions of our lives and our sociality. So the question, the obvious question is, is it possible uh, to return in a way to thou saying? And of course, return, the reason why he talks about the return here is because uh, from his point of view, our origin, both individually and culturally, is in thou saying. So insofar as we've deviated from that, it's about returning to something that we already knew in some sense. Okay, so what is required uh, to herald a return to the I thou? And his, <laughs> oh, you gotta love this, his kind of poetic way of putting it is what is required is to address the incubus of the it world by its true name. <laughs> Oh my goodness, <laughs> to address the incubus of the it world by its true name. Okay, so, uh, I don't know, maybe you remember the band Incubus. Uh, pretty good, I liked them, sort of, what, when were they? Like late 90s, right around 2000. 
band, um, but he's not talking about the band. He's talking about what the band is named after. So an incubus in uh, mythology is a kind of demon that visits you in your dreams and has sex with you in your dreams, okay? It's a male demon having sex with women. There's a female counterpart called a succubus, but he says call the incubus by its true name. So uh, think about that metaphorically, you know? So um, the incubus of the world of I it is what screws you while you're asleep, <laughs> okay? So, uh, uh, you know, okay, so to, I guess, bring the metaphor, I don't know, is that obvious enough already that, you know, if you live in a world that is uh, dominated through and through almost exclusively by it, maybe what's going on is that in a sense you're being screwed while you're not quite conscious, you're not quite awake somehow, all right? So, and the, the I guess the metaphorical import would be uh, if you want to return to Thou saying, it's gonna, you're going to have to wake up at some point, all right? Like you're going to have to um, uh, become awakened, you know, more, more aware, right? More perceptive, uh, more aware of what's going on with you and with the world too. But actually, uh, that's a theme that runs throughout all of the existential thinking that we've entertained this entire semester. Really, the whole thing is about an awakening project, ultimately, awakening to the reality of existence and learning to live accordingly. You know, So this is not just special, in a way, to Martin Buber. So to call the incubus of the it world by its true name, to call it exactly what it is. And uh, for him, the biggest impediment to doing that is what he calls in translation a kind of capriciousness that runs through our world and our time, our historical time. So uh, the capricious, here's what he says, the capricious man does not believe an encounter. In other words, say thou, right? So encounter is another metaphor he has for thou saying. Okay, so let's restart that. The capricious man does not believe an encounter. He does not know association. He only knows the feverish world out there and his feverish desire to use it. All right, so all, all the capriciousness of our time is that, uh, once again, we think that life is about satiating our desires, especially by way of, uh, well, as we noted a few minutes ago, uh, pre-snake, I guess, uh, you know, that uh, our lives are about producing and consuming and that ultimately what all that's about is our feverish desire to use the world we find ourselves in and concomitantly our feverish desire to use ourselves, each other, along the way. Okay, so uh, I guess to end, I'm trying to end off this video. So uh, to affect a movement to the I-Thou from this position, a, pers a person must, okay, now here comes his quote, sacrifice his little will, which is unfree, and ruled by things and drives to his great will that moves away from being determined to find destiny. Okay, so to sacrifice your little will, okay, your little willfulness, your small sense of who you are and what you think your life's about, that that might need to be sacrificed at some point. All the things, all the ways you have of thinking about yourself and about reality that keep you way smaller than you need to be, okay? To return to the thou, that might need to be sacrificed to your greater will that moves away from being determined and all of the, the sort of ways you have of thinking about life that would make you feel determined, basically imprisoned and enslaved, to find your destiny. Okay, so <laughs> that, in case you're looking for a new paradigm for your life, that might be one. You know, that your life might ultimately about, like, what are you learning in college? This might be an answer to that question, possible answer. Uh, play with it this way. Okay, you're allowed to be playful, especially if you're an existentialist. So maybe what you're learning in college is to learn to sacrifice your small will, to die as a small being, moment by moment, semester by semester, year by year, so that ultimately you can let something like your greater will, your greater self, 
emerge and become the main thing that's going on in your life. Maybe that's the real lesson you're learning in all your college classes, not just this one. And if it's not, well, maybe it could be. Just a thought. Okay, <laughs> have a good day. Take care.